So good evening. I'm uh, Nicola Owen. I'm the Chief Administrative Officer at, at Lancaster University and uh, I'd really like to welcome you all here uh, on behalf of the University to Beyond the Lancashire Witches, Writing and Freedom. This is a talk by the Department of English and Creative Writing and it's part of the University's 50th anniversary public lecture series. And if any of you have been to others in the series, you'll know that we have sought to position the public lectures at a variety of venues, both on campus and off campus. But I think tonight has to be the most atmospheric and I think will prove to be the most innovative use of space so far. Um, quite intriguing to see how it all works through. I discovered today that today is Lancashire Day. Um, and that seems particularly appropriate then for the subject that we're going to, to hear about today. And as you can see from your programme, um, the talk's going to be illustrated with readings and dramatisations, and here, live on these court benches, and also filmed in other parts of Lancaster Castle. It features a large cast of members from the department, and you'll see current and former members of staff, some undergraduate, postgraduate, and postdoctoral students. And we also welcome Carol Birch to our cast, a Lancaster-based novelist and our recent honorary graduate of the university. So in many, events, in many ways, this, this event follows university tradition. We, we've sought to, through the public lecture series, really bring together some of the, um, the important strengths of, of the university. And English was one of the founding departments in the university. It had a strong tradition from the outset of involvement with the performing arts, and that's obviously continued um, through to today, and also considerable depth of expertise in the early 17th century. From the beginning, the department's expertise was not only diverse, it included contemporary literature, the history of language and linguistics, but was also highly interdisciplinary, working with others through a wide range of majors and combined majors, notably with history and philosophy. And its head, Bill Murray, was a, a, played a, a leading role within the development of the university. And uh, it says in my script that the early staff were, without exception, strong characters who set their mark on the development of the department. I think that's a very polite way of describing some slightly unconventional, not to say anarchical elements, and long may that reign. But back to this evening, um, we hope that you'll really enjoy listening to this, this selection of unconventional strong voices from the 17th century through to the present day hopefully reined in from the anarchical uh, element, elements by Professor Alison Finley and Dr. Liz Oakley-Brown. So I hope you enjoy. In a year of celebration and commemoration, it's all too easy to forget the stories of cruelty, abuse and injustice that characterise this castle, a former prison and probably most famous for the incarceration of the so-called Lancashire witches, tried and executed in 1612. 400 years later, in 2012, our conference capturing witches, histories, stories, images, sought to acknowledge that event via historical, critical, political and creative papers and presentations. A selection of these were published this year in a special issue of the journal Press and Nature. It is not our aim to deny the ways in which these prisoners were the victims of abuse and injustice. However, with the decommissioning of the prison and the opening of Lancaster Castle as a heritage site, tonight we want to think about how the John of Gaunt Gate is now a threshold rather than a barrier. A site of incarceration has now become a space of reflection and even restorative community celebration. In the light of this transformation, our programme seeks to emphasise the ways that imprisonment forced testimonies and, testimonies and trials, going right back to 1612, can paradoxically be the inspiration for expressions of freedom. We begin with some of the 1612 testimonies, then move to examples of the Quakers' expressions of religious freedom, then on to contemporary rewritings of the Lancashire Witches, and finally to poems by a graduate student, now a lecturer and published poet, Andrew McMillan. And then we move to Extracts from Skate Gallows, a historical novel based on the life of prisoner Margaret Catchpole by Carol Birch, our honorary 50th anniversary graduate. The women accused of witchcraft in 1612 were confined physically and culturally by poverty and prejudice. 
While witchcraft was the cause of their imprisonment and execution, it also offered a fantasy of agency and communal pleasure. Witches moved freely, feasted together, danced, plotted revenge, activities denied to all these women in their everyday lives. Here then are the enforced testimonies, which are also testimonies of freedom, extracts from Thomas Potts's cre uh, printed account of the 1612 trial, the wonderful discovery of witches in the county of Lancaster, spoken by postgraduate and undergraduate students, and Dr. Alison Easton, former member of the department who was much involved with the development of Lancaster's Centre for Women's Studies. The speakers in the film, you'll see who are wearing deliberately bright colours, were filmed in the darkness of the witch's dungeon in the well tower. Elizabeth Southerns confesseth, and saith, about twenty years passed, and she was coming homeward from begging, there appeared to her, in the sad forest of Pendle, a spirit, or devil, in the shape of a boy, saying to her, if she would give him her soul, she would have whatever she would crest. Mm -hmm. So, this examinant, in half of such games, as was promised, was contented. And the said spirit or devil appeared to her at sundry times about daylight gate, always bidding her stay, asking her what would she have or do. Anne Whittle, alias Chattox, saith that a thing like a Christian man requested to give him her soul. <laughs> In the end, this examinate was contented to give him her soul. Whereupon the devil said, Thou shalt want nothing, and be revenged on whom thou list. And the devil further commanded, She should call him by the name of Fancy. And when she wanted anything, or be revenged, on any, call on fancy, and he would be ready. And at the same time, he said, there was a thing in the likeness of a spotted dog that came unto the said Demdike, which then spake unto her and said she should have gold silver and worldly wealth at her will and at the same time she said there was a victuals this flesh butter cheese, bread and drink, and bid them eat enough. And at the banquet, the spirits gave them light, so they could see what they did, though they neither had fire nor candlelight. Jeanette Bailey and Ellen Bailey, taking this examinant with them, went to Salisbury Church, and there did take up the child. And did boil some thereof in a pot, and some did broil upon the coals, of which Janet and Ellen did eat. And afterward, Janet and Ellen did seethe the bones of the child in a pot, and with the fat that came out of the bones, they said they would anoint themselves, that thereby they might sometimes change themselves into other shapes. And after all this, 
They said they would lay the bones again in the grave the next night following. And about half a year ago, the said Janet Bearley, Ellen Bearley, Jane Southworth, and this examinate, who went by the appointment of the said Janet, her grandmother, met at a place called Red Bank, upon the north side of the water of Ribble. Every Thursday and Sunday at night, by the space of a fortnight, and at the waterside, there came unto them, as they were going thither, four black things, going upright, and yet not like men in the face. Which four did carry, the said three women? And this examinant. Over the water. And when they came to the said red bank, they found something there, which they did eat. And after they had eaten, the said three women, and this examinant, danced. Every one of them with one of the black things aforesaid. After they had danced, the said black things did pull down the said three women and did abuse their bodies. As this examinate thinketh, for she saith that the black thing that was with her did abuse her body. Um, so the scene that you're about to see performed, as Liz said, is from The Late Lancashire Witch, is a play from 1634. Um, this is an unusual play in lots of respects, um, partly because in the 1630s the narrative goes that uh, the witchcraft craze has died down, but in fact this play shows that it was still very much alive. This play is based on the events that happened in Lancashire in the early 1630s, so some 20 years after Pendle, where a nine-year-old boy, Edmund Robinson, accused his neighbours of witchcraft and specifically of uh, having been taken to a sabbat, um, a sort of uh, a, a communal feast. Um, what is different from Pendle in this case is that the authorities overturn the conviction of the witches in Lancashire and the witches are taken down to London for a retrial. And this is the exact moment that the playwrights, Hayward and Broom, choose to write a play based on the events of that trial. So theoretically, people uh, in London could go and see the witches in prison in the day and then they could go and see a play based on their life in the evening. So it registers a really extraordinary historic moment. Also, it played for three days in a row, which is a Renaissance hit. Um, normally, it was only one day. The reason why I'm here is because for the Capturing Witches Conference, I directed a staged reading around the castle. Uh, what was really special about that was it was the first time that a witch trial had taken place in the castle since the trial of the witches who were the subject of the play. So it was an extraordinary coming together of history, performance, sight. Um, so it was marvellous to be involved with. I think that the theme tonight, writing and freedom, what I'm really interested in in the scene that you're going to see tonight, which is a court scene, is the way in which the women evade language and they refuse to submit to the trial which is enforced upon them by their neighbours. These aren't actually judges this is their neighbours trying to try them. Um, so they, they are silent and they laugh and they try to evade the strictures being placed upon them. Unfortunately, one of them submits, as you'll see. Um, I'd also just like to take a couple of minutes to uh, say something about the fact that when I performed or when I staged this in 2012, um, Olga Horner, who is a very long-standing member of the Lancaster University English and Creative Writing Department was in it and she did some really beautiful work and she did some very sweet and heartbreaking scenes 
um, and unfortunately she passed away this year. So I'd like to dedicate this performance to Olga. Thank you. I have catched a whole kennel of witches. They are all in officers' hands, and I will touch here with two or three of them for a little private parley before they go to the justices. Make a full stop there. Sides, sides. You know her not as I do. Stand aloof there, mistress. Oh, here comes more of your nods. Nod Dickerson, odds fish, and your granny Johnson too. We want but a good fire to entertain them. See how they lay their heads together. No succour, no relief, no comfort. Morsey, my Morsey, my gentle Morsey, come, my mammalian. What do they say? They call their spirits, I think. Now a shame take you for a father of fools. Have you known so many of the devil's tricks and can be ignorant of that common feat of the old juggler? That is to leave you all to the law when you are once seized on by the talons of authority. But let us see we can by examination get from them something that may abbreviate the cause unto the wiser in commission for the peace before we carry them before them. Stand out, soldier and lay your accusation upon them. A bad night I have had, a murrain take your mill sprites. <laughs> Prithee tell me, hast thou been frighted then? How frighted, sir? A dung cart full of devils could not do it. But I've been so nicked and pulled and pinched by a company of hellcats. Yet I've kept my face whole, thanks my scimitar my trusty Bilbo, <laughs> but for which I vow I had been torn to pieces, but I think I met with some of them. One, I am sure, I have sent flying hence. Did thou fasten upon any? I sliced off a cat's foot there, that is since a hand, whoever wants it. Laugh, gentlewoman! What say you to all these matters? I will say nothing, for what you know, you know. As the law shall find me, so let them take me. I say so also. Other confession you get none from us. What say you, Granny? Vermilion! Go! Vermilion! Vermilion! Who's that you call? My friend, my sweetheart. Aha! That's her devil, her incubus, I warrant. Poor old woman, stand out. I'll dandle a witch a little. Thou wilt speak and tell the truth, and shalt have favour, doubt not. Say, art not thou a witch? Tis folly to dissemble. Yes, sir, I am. And that familion which thou callst upon is thy familiar devil, is it not? Nay, pretty speak. Yes, sir. That's a good woman. How long has had acquaintance, huh? A matter of six years, sir. A pretty matter. What, was he like a man? Yes, when I pleased. And then he lay with thee, did he not sometimes? Tis folly to dissemble. Twice a week he never failed me. Mm, and how, how a little, was he a good bedfellow? Tis folly to speak worse of him than he is. Aye, trust me, is it? Give the devil his due. Ah, oh, he pleased me well, sir, like a proper man. There was sweet coupling. Only his flesh felt cold. He wanted his great fires about him that he has at home. Did he wear good clothes? Oh, oh, gentlemanlike, but black. Black points and all. Aye, very like his points were black enough. But Carl will trifle with you no longer. Now shall you all to the justices and let them take order with you till the sizes, and let law take his course. And vivat Rex. Honour for Drover with your untoward cattle. Now, 
while the witches must expect their due, by lawful justice, we appeal to you for favourable censure. What their cry may bring upon them, ripeness yet of time has not revealed. Perhaps great mercy may, after just condemnation, give them day of longer life. We represent as much as they have done before law's hand did touch upon their guilt, but dare not hold it fit that we for justices and judges sit and personate their grave wisdoms on the stage, whom we are bound to honour. No, the age allows it not. Therefore, unto the laws, we can but bring the witches and their cause, and there we leave them as their devils did. Should we go further with them, wit forbid. What of their story further shall ensue? We must refer to time, ourselves to you. And remarkably, they went down to London and they were released. They weren't found guilty, but they were sent back to Lancaster and imprisoned again, even though they'd been found not guilty. So conflict between the lawmaking community of North Lancashire and the apparently rebellious subjects which we saw in the late Lancashire witches was repeated less than 20 years later with the advent of Quaker belief. In October 1652, George Fox, one of the founders of the Quakers, found himself under scrutiny at the quarter sessions held in Lancaster Castle. Hearing the case against him were several magistrates and lined up against him, so his journal tells us, were 40 priests intent on proving that he was a blasphemer. Fox's appearance at the castle was the culmination of several months of intense activity. Fox had arrived in the northwest in May 1652. Climbing up Pendle Hill, he had had a vision of a great people to be gathered, and so it turned out. As he travelled up to Sedba and across to Kendal and beyond, the movement grew rapidly, with many hundreds of people convinced of the Quaker message. Many others, and especially the clergy, were bitterly and at times violently opposed to the interpretation of Christianity that he preached. Later in the summer of 1652, Fox arrived at Swarthmore Hall near Ulverston, home of Judge Thomas Fell, his wife Margaret, their children and servants. Margaret and most of the household were convinced by Fox and became central to the movement from then on. Judge Fell never became a Quaker, but he was nonetheless sympathetic to Fox. And it's Judge Fell who presides over the hearing at the castle. So, what was at stake for Fox at the hearing? Most immediately, his freedom to speak the truth as he understood it, and as the Lord moved him to speak it. As you'll see, he was questioned about what he'd said, and his words are examined closely to see if they might have been blasphemous. Most important in this respect is the question of whether he had claimed to be equal with God, which was specifically prohibited by the Blasphemy Act of 1650. Fox denies claiming equality with God. Instead, he says that, in line with the Bible, he claimed to be in unity with God. Quoting Hebrews 2.11, he says, He that sanctifieth and he that is sanctified are one. Judge Fell joins in the argument. To claim unity, says Fell, precludes the possibility of claiming equality. Because equality requires that there should be two distinct entities, which is exactly what Fox denies. Also at stake in the hearing is the number of witnesses to the alleged offence. The Blasphemy Act explicitly required that there should be two or more witnesses. This requirement is also tested by Fell in the course of the hearing. Were Fox to have been found guilty, he would have been liable to imprisonment, committed to prison or the House of Correction for the space of six months without bail. So freedom of belief and freedom of speech were directly implicated in the securing of his physical freedom. But behind these freedoms, was what Fox saw as a faith rooted in freedom. 
Later in 1652, he wrote, God is free and will have his people so. And his grace is free, his gospel is free to every creature and not to be bought and sold for money. Truth, Fox said, made us free, never again to be entangled in a yoke of bondage. It was for the freedom to continue to speak openly of his vision of a God-given truth, a truth given freely to his people in order to bring them too to a state of liberty for which Fox spoke out at the sessions at Lancaster Castle. The scene you're about to watch is performed by current or previous members of the Department of English and Creative Writing. They're joined by David Novell from Lancaster Royal Grammar School who plays Michael Olsen, headmaster uh, of LRGS from 1653. The scene they will read is taken from a paper inserted into George Fox's journal, an incomplete transcript of the hearing at the castle on Monday, the 18th of October, 1652. Pray be upstanding in the courtroom. Upstanding. The courtroom was crowded, the discussion at times disorderly. On the bench were at least three magistrates, with Judge Thomas Fell in the colourful robe here in charge. Justice John Sorey, across here stands on the left with those making the case against Fox. Sorry is the one who had drawn up a warrant for Fox's arrest. On the right stands George Fox, supported by a small group of fellow Quakers. The transcript begins in the middle of the hearing. Wait. Wait, stand up. <laughs> You may sit. Are you a scholar and so irrational as to say that we were talking and after he said that he was equal with God? Set some face upon what you have said. Were you a party to the discourse? And can you remember one part and forget another? Hath not this Mr. Smith showed great zeal and said he wished it were in his power to have disposed of George Fox? If he had had the power, he said, that he would have made him to have forsaken his profession and to have denied that he had the spirit of God. And if he had had George Fox in his power, he would have taken away his life. I deny that I would have taken away his life, but he was calling of me devil and child of perdition and I asked him how I became a devil and he said that he was the judge of the world and I said if it were in my power I would have made him recall that word. Did he say I George Fox am the judge of the world? Thou said to me it will be thou shalt see me in that mind and thou and I were in Scotland. He said if he had it in his power he would have taken away his life. First First you say that he was equal with God, and then you say that he let fall these words, that he was equal with God. To the second question, that God taught deceit. He spoke against all teachers, but God himself, that teaches purely and perfectly. We were speaking of the Bible, and I affirmed it to be the word of God, and he asked, how I could witness it. And I answered, by itself. And he said, that was without. And I said, that was within, because God's spirit witnessed with mine. That you confessed, God's spirit doth witness. But where doth it witness? In the church or the pulpit? Go on. Upon that, he said, God taught deceit. He might say, thou holds out deceit. It was taken notice of by Robert Withers that he said God taught deceit. I heard no such word as I am a Christian. 
George spoke these words and Robert put forth his hand and said, God forgive thee. And after, Robert said, he means this, that God teaches to know deceit. It is not probable that any such words should follow. Now, for a man to say that uh, God teaches deceit, there's no dependence upon these words. What say you to the third question? That the scripture was antichrist. He asked me what the word was. I had a Bible in my hand. And he said, that was antichrist. He affirmed that the scriptures were carnal and that it was antichrist. He said the Bible was a declaration of God. He was condemning and calling me devil. And I asked him, how comes thou to judge so? And he said, I am the judge of the world. And at that, I was much troubled within me. And thereupon, you would take away his life? I said, if I had the power in me, I would have made him to have renounced these words which were spoken. What say you to that, uh, that he was as upright as Christ? That he said he was as upright as Christ. You are a single witness to that. That God taught deceit, you are single to that. So one, two, three. Here's a single witness only. That was not so spoken, that I was equal with God. He that sanctifieth and he that is sanctified are one. They are one in the Father and in the Son, of his flesh and of his bone. This the Scripture doth witness, and ye are the sons of God, and the Father and the Son are one, etc. Equality shows two distinct. But he saith, they are one, they are equal. But he doth not say that he is equal with God. But he saith, he that sanctifieth and them which are sanctified are one. They are equal. I, I cannot tell what you should make of that. The same thing cannot be equal. Many may be one. But they may not be equal. Oneness argues unity. There is an unity with God, and where there is an unity, there may be equality. Answer to the question that God taught deceit. That is false and was never spoken by me. God is pure. What say you to that, that the scripture are antichrist? That is false. But they which profess the scriptures and live not in the life and power of them as they did that gave them forth, that I witness to be antichrist. That he was the judge of the world? As he is, so are we in this present world. That the saints are made the righteousness of God. He that sanctifieth and they that are sanctified are one. They are united. All this is not to say that he is equal with God. The Father and the Son are one. I believe that he will say that he is sanctified, and then he is equal with God. The words charged are not proved but by a single witness. Here was a warrant out against him, charging him to be guilty of blasphemy. And there are none of the words that he is charged with within the words of the Acts, and I am persuaded many of these things are put upon him. Please be upstanding. Fox was dismissed by the magistrates 
As he put it, the Lord's power was wonderfully set over all and his gospel was freely preached that day over the heads of 40 hireling priests. He was free to continue his preaching work up and down the country and overseas. Twelve years later, however, in 1664, Fox once again found himself in Lancaster Castle, this time imprisoned here as he awaited a trial at the Assizes for refusing to take an oath, the oath of allegiance to the king. Here is what he said about the conditions in which he was held. And so they committed me again to close prison. And Colonel Kirby gave order to the jailer that no flesh alive must come at me, for I was not fit to be discoursed with by men. So I was put up in a smoky tower, where the smoke of the other rooms came up and stood as a dew upon the walls, where it rained in also upon my bed, and the smoke was so thick I could hardly see a candle sometimes, and many times locked under three locks, and the under jailer would hardly come up to unlock one of the upper doors. The smoke was so thick that I was almost smothered with smoke and so starved with cold and rain that my body was almost numbed and my body swelled with the cold. And many times when I went to stop out the rain of me in the cold winter season, my shift would be as wet as muck with rain that came in upon me. And as fast as I stopped it, the wind being high and fierce would blow it out again. And in this manner did I lie all that long cold winter until the next assizes. George Fox was by no means the only Quaker to be held in Lancaster Castle. Among the many other friends imprisoned here in the 1660s, was Margaret Fell, by now a widow. She was held here from 1664 to 1668, during which time she wrote many pamphlets, including her most famous one, Women Speaking Justified. In this short pamphlet, she argues that women and men share a spiritual equality and that women who live according to the God-given light within them are therefore as free to testify to divine truth as men are. To make her case, she draws on texts from the Bible, which enables her to equate the silencing of godly women with the work of the devil. As you will hear, her pamphlet relies not on the development of a coolly rational argument, but on the accumulation of a powerful and highly charged biblical idiom. Let this word of the Lord, which was from the beginning, stop the mouths of all those that oppose women speaking in the power of the Lord. For he hath put enmity between the woman and the serpent, and if the seed of the woman speak not, the seed of the serpent speaks. For God hath put enmity between the two seeds, and it is manifest that those that speak against the woman and her seed speaking, speak out of the envy of the old serpent's seed. But all this opposing and gainsaying of women speaking hath arisen out of the bottomless pit and spirit of darkness that has spoken for these many hundred years together in this night of apostasy. But blessed be the Lord, his time is over, which was above 1,200 years, and the darkness is past, and the night of apostasy draws to an end. And the true light now shines, the morning light the bright morning star, the root and offspring of David. He is risen, he is risen. Glory to the highest forevermore, and the joy of the morning is come. And the bride, the lamb's wife, is making herself ready as a bride that is adorning for her husband. And to her is granted that she shall be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. And the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints, the holy Jerusalem is descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and her light is like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And this is that free woman that all the children of the promise are born of. 
not the children of the bondwoman, which is Hagar, which genders to strife and to bondage, and which answers to Jerusalem, which is in bondage with her children. But this is the Jerusalem which is free, which is the mother of us all. And so this bondwoman and her children that are now born after the flesh have persecuted them that are born after the spirit until even now. But now the bondwoman and her seed is to be cast out that have kept so long in bondage and in slavery and under limits. This bondwoman and her brood is to be cast out and our holy city, the new Jerusalem, is coming down out of heaven and her light will shine through the whole earth even as a jasper stone, clear as crystal, which brings freedom and liberty and perfect redemption to her whole seed. And this is that woman in the eternal image of God that God hath owned and doth own and will own forevermore. What we're going to do now is to move to the contemporary and to contemporary rewritings, but we're going actually back, not to the, the very contemporary writings, but contemporary rewritings of the Lancashire witches again. So I'm very pleased to introduce my colleague, Dr. Catherine Spooner, and she's going to be joined here by Chloe Buckley, um, transformed from a Lancashire witch into a postgraduate student working <laughs> on contemporary writings. The purpose of this presentation is to take up where the performances have left off and present a brief overview of the legacy of the witches in contemporary literature and other media. The story of the witches has proved a powerful narrative that not only continues to inspire contemporary writers, artists and musicians, but also to shape the, the identity of Lancashire and its people. The historical event of the trial has been instrumental in the production of what we might call a literary and cultural Lancashire Gothic. In other words, the construction of the region as a Gothic and occulted space. The first rewritings of the witch's story took the form of local folklore and oral storytelling. This evening, we have heard extracts from the witch's testimonies as recorded in Potts's wonderful discovery. As historian Robert Paul comments, Potts's account was intended to demonstrate a modern, rational justice system at work, but unintentionally reinforced the county's long-standing reputation as a sink of superstition. Paul describes how Potts's account circulated in the 18th and 19th centuries, the contents transmitted orally at second and third hand, merging and recirculating with existing stories. He suggests that, it is likely that much of what seemed to be oral tradition about witchcraft was actually recycled pots, whose tales of witchcraft merged once more with the folk culture whence they came. Fact, fiction and folklore were from the first intertwined in inextricable and complex ways. The witches first became the subject of fiction, however, in the 19th century. The Witchcraft Act of 1735 made it illegal to accuse a person of witchcraft, and as a result, witchcraft tales increasingly became less the stuff of belief and more the stuff of entertainment. The first direct fictional representation of the Pendle Witches was William Harrison Ainsworth's The Lancashire Witches, A Romance of Pendle Forest, serialised in the Sunday Times in 1848 and a bestseller throughout the 19th century. It is an extravagant and sensational Gothic novel that fully endorses the witches' evil and magic, focusing on their attempts to corrupt the beautiful and innocent Alison device. It could, in many ways, be said to preempt the British folk horror tradition celebrated in films of the 1960s and 70s, such as Witchfinder General, Blood on Satan's Claw, and The Wicker Man, establishing a kind of folkloric Gothic. Elizabeth Gaskell's gothic tale, The Poor Clare, published just a few years later, continues the association between the Pendle region, witchcraft, and recusant Catholicism, although it is set around 100 years after the trials. Interestingly, although Gaskell endorses the supernatural, she also portrays the witch as an impoverished victim, bringing her sharp sense of social injustice to bear upon the subject, and anticipating a much later development in the representation of the witches. Along with Ainsworth, however, the most significant text in setting the parameters of how the witches were subsequently represented is Robert Neal's Mist Over Pendle of 1951. 
a novel that straddled the border between serious historical novel, interrogating the religious and social tensions of the period, and pulp fantasy, as you can see from the early cover that I've um, included on the slide. This novel, again, imagined the witches as malevolent, and it has a real threat to the community. Interestingly, however, Neil rationalises this threat so that the witches kill through poison rather than magical agency, thus anticipating the more wholly rationalised approach of the later 20th century. After Mist Over Pendle, the next significant wave of interest in the witches was in the 1980s, when Manchester band The Fall wrote the splendidly opaque Lucifer Over Lancashire, and director Paweł Polakowski used it to soundtrack his influential documentary of the same title. The documentary explores the tensions between evangelical Christianity and modern pagans in 1980s Lancashire, creating direct links between the original witches and the contemporary situation, and deliberately locating them in the political context of Thatcherism and post-industrial deprivation. It exhibits what we might call a psychogeographical impulse, mapping the way the hidden or occulted histories of the landscape continue to exert an influence on its present inhabitants. This theme was taken up again in 2012 in the Eccentronic Research Council's album, album of Electronica, 1612 Underture, featuring Bolton-born actress Maxine Peake narrating a travelogue, seeking out the traces of the witches around modern-day Pendle Hill. In the 1990s, a new wave of writers informed by feminism and identity politics sought to restore the witches' voices and turn them from the objects into the subjects of their story. These poets, dramatists, and novelists sought to expose the social and historical forces conspiring in the witches' oppression, positioning them as victims of poverty and patriarchy. And increasingly, magic was rationalized away. In Richard, Richard McSween's play, Sabbat, for example, first performed in 1995, there is no magic at all. Alice Nutter is a local wise woman and healer using herbal remedies. Janet Device, a half-crazed beggar whose tales of witchcraft enable her a sense of compensatory power in an otherwise brutal and impoverished life. This was not the only approach to the witches available, however. Joseph Delaney's wildly successful Wardstone Chronicles incorporated witch folklore into a magical, fantastic Lancashire aimed specifically at child readers. And I'm going to skip quite briefly over Delaney as Chloe is going to talk about these novels in much more detail in a moment. But I just want to note before I do so, the release of the big budget Hollywood adaptation of the first in the series, which is forthcoming in March. So this is the first, um, the first film version of The Lancashire Witches, um, soon to be followed by another, as I'm going to mention in just a moment. Finally, the 400-year anniversary of the trials in 2012 led to an explosion of new works or reissues of previous work about the witches. Poetry, represented here in this image by Caroline Duffy's Waymarkers on the route probably taken by the witches from Pendle to Lancaster. Drama, documentary, and of course, fiction, including Jeanette Winterson's The Daylight Gate, currently being developed, by, developed for film by Hammer Studios. With the exception of Winterson's rather more ambiguous work, the dominant tone of the majority of these texts was one of memorialization, of marking the historical event, paying respects to the men and women who died, and passing on a message about social injustice and the value of tolerance to a new generation. To complete this talk, Chloe and I want to discuss a couple of these works in a little more detail and identify contrary impulses towards pedagogical realism and fantasy. Our chief examples are two novels for children, Livy Michael's Malkin Child and Joseph Delaney's The Spook's Apprentice. Malkin Child, commissioned by local arts organization Litfest for the anniversary and distributed to schools, avoids endorsement of the supernatural. Demons do seem to exist, but only as a kind of collective fancy, a wish fulfillment fantasy of power for the powerless, which may be entirely psychological. One of the novel's most notable features is the way that it questions the process of historiography, or the writing of history, showing that whoever holds the pen holds the power. In doing so, it has a transparent pedagogical purpose in promoting the value of literacy. As the nine-year-old narrator, Janet, says of magistrate Roger Noel, I wished I could read what he wrote, or even better, that I could write for myself. You never know what someone else is writing about you. 
This leads to repeated reflections on the fallibility of language in its efforts to recapture historical truth. For example, so that a spelk, meaning a splint, is recorded by Noel as a spell. And moreover, as the use of language as an instrument of power. And I quote from, at length from the end of the novel, this is Janet speaking. I could see how all their chanting and spelling never did them any good. None of their words had any real power. No one listened to them, not really. No one listened to their side of the story, same as no one listened to me. If Roger Noel had his way, no one had listened to anyone but him. But everyone's got a story, and if they don't tell it, then other people will tell it for them. There's only one way to make your words have power, and that's to tell your own story in your own way. That's why I'm telling it now, to you. In this passage and throughout the novel as a whole, the reader is positioned as privileged, intimate witness, a witness to an alternative testimony, one that will never be heard in court. And this emphasis on hearing the true version of events tends to undercut the emphasis on storytelling and the constructed nature of historical narrative. The purpose is to teach, to convey a message to a presumed child reader that will reinforce the importance of education as a prerequisite of freedom. Okay, so in contrast to this adaptation of the Lancashire Witch's story, Malkin Child, Joseph Delaney's The Wardstone Chronicles keeps very little of familiar historical fact. In interviews, Delaney distances his books from the well-known history and is keen to emphasise that his work is a complete fiction. He simply borrows the landscape of Pendle Hill, the villages, some names and a detail here and there. In this way, he says, he seeks to avoid criticism Working in the genre of dark fantasy, these books present Pendle as a treacherous land populated by a horde of gruesome witches. These characters are not represented as victims of prejudice or persecution, but rather as agents of the dark who kill children and perform dreaded blood magic. Yet Delaney's patchwork use of details of the historical Pendle constitutes a more complex response than a simple rejection of historical facts and descent into sensationalism. But that's not, what, that's not what is going on at all. Um, the Wardstone Chronicles happily jettison all claims to authenticity that historical narratives struggle to establish. The text is free from any strong emotional, political, pedagogical, or social investment in the innocence of the witches. As overt fantasy fiction, Delaney's works readily embrace gothic and fantastic elements that have look, been looked upon with suspicion by others engaging with the Pendle story. In particular, the commentary surrounding the 400-year anniversary constructed a strong polemic between realist, and therefore good, and fantastical, and therefore suspect, representations of the witches, and fantasy obviously occupied the less privileged position. Critics in particular were quite dismissive of Jeanette Winterson's novel, The Daylight Gate, because of its use of horror and fantasy. However, the strong generic taxonomies and characters of fantasy fiction necessarily shift the focus away from real people and real events, and thus is able to offer new possibilities for representation. <clears throat> this offers the trial victims agency they are sometimes elsewhere denied. One of Delaney's witches in particular, a girl called Alice Dean, who's about um, nine also when the books start, she's another version of the Malkin child or Janet Devis, and offers a, way, a different way of reading this story. Delaney's Alice Dean is an orphan, and she's taken on her parents' death by her aunt, Boney Lizzie, to be trained in dark magic by the Malkin clan. Like Janet Devis, she turns on her family, escaping the clutches of cruel Boney Lizzie and delivering her abuser to justice at the hands of the novel's protagonists, the Spook and Tom. Yet Alice is never simply represented as a reformed witch, betraying her family to save herself, nor is she a vulnerable abuse victim exploited by others. Rather like Potts's Janet Devis, Alice must prove her modesty, government, and understanding in giving evidence against her family and help the good guys, the main characters, Tom and Spook, enact justice. Tom convinces himself that Alice is an innocent. He tells himself Alice had been a victim too. 
But Alice will not be recuperated by this act of social work on her behalf. Alice always resists any attempt to fix her position. She's neither innocent nor villain. The main character, Tom, realizes that, realizes that there is no way for him to know if, Alison, if Alice is innocent or not. She might end up neither good nor bad, he says. She might end up somewhere in between. That would make her very dangerous to know. Alice grows as the series progresses, fluid, changing, unfixed, and powerfully potential. Janet Davis, on the other hand, seems destined to be fixed as either a gothic child spectre, as she is in BBC 4's The Pendle Witch Child documentary of 2011, fronted by Simon Armitage, or an illiterate victim, as she is in Malkin Child. Moving beyond the historical facts into the terrain of fantasy provides a space where we do not need to know the truth. Fantasy offers the opportunity to recognize that the reconstruction of the past is as much a process of myth-making as it is discovery of truth. Moreover, the generic taxonomies of fantasy and its freedom from historical veracity offers the witches a more complex and ambiguous role than they have been offered elsewhere. So in this presentation, we have shown how writing in different ways offers different stories of those condemned as witches in 1612. Different genres of writing offer imaginative freedom to explore history beyond the bare facts. Okay, so now beyond the walls. Um, Imprisonment doesn't necessarily require huge walls like those of Lancaster Castle. Um, and this next item, which is designed to go beyond prison walls, focuses on the cases of women um, trapped in relationships. 25th of November, two days ago, was International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. And there are 10 days of campaigning promoted by the United Nations reminds us perhaps that we're still close to that world of the Lancashire witches. These two poems that you're now going to hear are by Andrew Macmillan, um, a recent graduate who now teaches creative writing at Liverpool John Moores University. Andrew came back to Lancaster two weeks ago um, to be filmed um, on the top floor of the curtain wall of the castle in the, the governor's watch, uh, lodgings, and he's reading two poems, the first one called Leader to Her Daughters, and then Finally. Leader to Her Daughters. I feel battered. He put the thing his species talks with up inside me, and he talked. Daughter, the moment when he opens out and stretches is when he looks most beautiful. The moment when he looks most beautiful is the moment right before he breaks your arm. Daughter, on his own he's only half a heart. Daughter, he made me his pen. He made me do the messy things he keeps beneath the surface. Daughter, his feet, his eyes, were hungry for the sky. When he came, he made a sound that still hatches in my throat each morning. How typical of a man, daughter, to pretend he didn't understand, to think my outstretched hand might be an offering of food, daughter, to think that I would feed him. Finally, a day will come when, woken by the xylophone of sun through blinds, you'll realise that the beach was not the place where horses tore the sand to ribbon, that the scent of him has lifted from the last of the sheets, that he isn't coming back, that it hasn't rained, but the birds are pretending that it has, so they can sing. Okay, and finally, following finally, I'm delighted to be able to introduce the novelist, Carol Birch, who's one of the university's 50th anniversary honorary graduates. 
and Carol is going to read three extracts from her 2008 novel, Skate Gallows, which is based on the life of an 18th century prisoner, Margaret Catchpole, whose writings Carol researched when in Australia. Um, so the short film that you're going to see while Carol is reading records some examples of those, how those people who were imprisoned in the castle across history literally inscribed themselves by writing into the fabric of the building with letters, with dates, and with photographs. Thank you, Carol. I didn't actually go to Australia, I'm afraid. Um, the passages that I'm going to read are from Scape Gallows. Um, it's my fictionalised account of the life of a real woman, Margaret Catchpole, who in the 18th century was um, twice condemned to death. She was twice in the death cell, twice she was reprieved, and eventually she ended up being one of the first of the deportees to Australia when it was a new penal colony. Now, in the 18th century, um, the penal code in this country was absolutely draconian. To give some examples, um, a seven-year-old boy was hanged in King's Lynn for theft. Um, there was a case of a woman who was hanged because she had actually, in a draper's shop, had picked up a bolt of cloth, thought about stealing it, then decided not to and put it back down again, but she was still hanged and so on. You could basically be hanged or burned for what seem very trivial offences by our standards today. Um, Thousands of men, women, and children were hanged and burned, and Margaret Catchpole's offence was for horse stealing. She was servant to a wealthy family in Ipswich called the Cobolds. I don't know if you've heard of the, the Tolly Cobold beer, the brewers. Um, she was their nursemaid and, and servant, but she had a double life. She was also the girlfriend of a smuggler, Will Lord, and um, the bit that I'm going to read you is from a time when this, this actually did, did happen, Will was imprisoned in London for a trivial offence and she stole a horse, dressed as a boy and rode to London to try and sell the horse to buy his freedom. Of course, she didn't succeed and she ended up in the notorious Newgate Jail. And this is um, what she experiences in, New in Newgate. Rooms opening into rooms. We were in a stone maze, the maggoty borrowings and windings of the jail. There was nothing at all in that place to lift the spirit or please the eye, or indeed any of the senses. And the further in we proceeded, the deeper grew the smell. Imagine a privy left forgotten and unemptied in the high summer. Imagine dozens of them and the heavy stagnant air, like a hand sitting on your face, making you want to cover your mouth and nose. But you couldn't. And as the smell thickened, so did the noise become more and more diabolical. A rabble on a market day, a crowd around the gallows, muffled and moulded by walls, distorted by echoes. We walked down a passage with strong black doors on, the, on either side, one of which reverberated to constant blows as if a mindless monster was hurling itself against the door. Behind another, someone screamed as if demons were nipping at her. They put us under the ground in a dark, foul place with low shelves all around the walls and women lying on them. I had a mat and a blanket, a big iron ring in the floor to which the guard attached my shackles and a chamber pot, crusty inside. A fire winked through the darkness. I made out women sitting about it, the rising smoke of pipes, here and there a candle. Women shouting, pissing, drinking, shrieking with laughter. Nearby, someone moaned. Margaret was actually uh, unusual for the servant class of the day in that she could read and write. Um, I think if I was ever imprisoned, I would go mad if I couldn't have access to paper and pencil and, uh, and to books. And I think that's why it's paramount that prisoners now should have access to this and it is actually being wound back away from them. The access to books is being made harder. Um, Margaret was lucky because she was taught by her employers to read and write. And it's very fortunate for us because when she was eventually transported, she was a great letter writer. She wrote many letters home and um, to the Cobolds, to her uncle and aunt Leda, to her other uncles and aunts and to her father and so on. And she left us a fascinating account of what it was like to be a prisoner in the early days of the, of the penal colony. 
She was a great letter writer, and when after two weeks in Newgate Jail, she was actually moved to her home jail of Ipswich, the first thing she did was sit down and write a letter to her father and her brother. Thursday, 6th of July, 1797. My dearest Dad and Ned, it is with great pleasure I pick up my pen to inform you I have this night arrived in Ipswich. Please come and see me. Is Ned angry with me? Please tell him to come. I am happy to be back home. This jail is so much better than Newgate, which is a shocking place. Here I have my own cell where I'm writing to you now. I'm also writing to my uncle and aunt Leda, and aunt and uncle Catchpole, and to Mrs. Cobbold, who has been so very good to me and paid all my costs in Newgate. She has paid Will's costs too, so now he is free. That is how kind she is. He has sent me a very nice letter saying all will be well, and I've told him he must write and thank her, so she will see what an educated man he is. From my cell, I can see the willows at St. Margaret's Green if I stand on my bed. I can see the fields where I used to take the children for their walks. Dad, can you get some things I left at the widow sire's? A blue cap and a piece of amber and my bit of green muslin with the roses on. I left them all in the top front room. Don't worry about me, Dad. I'm to go to the assizes at Berry on the 9th of August. But in fact, there was need to worry and Margaret was sentenced to death at the assizes. Here she is in the death cell. And this is the final clip. After the candle was out, I wrote in the dark, another letter to Dad and Ned. I didn't want to go to sleep. I didn't ever want to sleep again. Time was short. I must see Will before I died. Died, the word itself was strange. Two days and nights passed, and I didn't sleep. We bad women, I thought, me and Jane Brewer I saw hanged when I was six, how the death sweat shook her, Anne Beddingfield, burned to fine ash, and her lover hung on Rushmere Heath. Mary Bryant, who got away from Botany Bay but lost her babies. Bad women, all of us. Sisters we were. And brothers. They say I shall suffer Saturday week. My hands were cold and covered in sweat. The body has wisdom and knows. My life had quivered down to one big prayer from me to everything that was not me. Do not cast me off. Do not shed me like a skin. Time ran by like sand. It lasted an eternity. There were certain aches, one grinding, impossible in every part of me, the pull of fear. One cruel and bloody right in the center of my heart, and that one was grief, I suppose, stabbing at the thought of Will and my dad and just about everyone I ever knew. Everyone was dear to me now, even Aunt Leda, even John Luff, even Matt Sampson, who'd made such game of me at Priory Farm and got me in trouble. Everyone's dear when you're about to die. I hadn't thought about Priory Farm in ages. On Saturday afternoon, a week to the day before death, I fell into a strange, deep sleep and dreamed I was there, running about under the trees near the wooden bridge that used to go over the stream that came out of the moat. I was playing with Boson, the turnspit dog, and it was a beautiful day. Glorious sunshine. Spring it must have been, because the daffodils were out. We had a lovely romp, Boson and me. It was a very happy dream. Someone shook me awake. Rise and shine, a voice said. It's time. Thank you. So, to, to conclude, the study of English literature and creative writing facilitates critical reading, thinking, and writing about the local and global environments we inhabit. As a way of celebrating 50 years of the department at Lancaster University, this evening's programme has given us the opportunity to work, think, and create together. And it's been wonderful to have everybody within the, the department working so well together, so thank you very much, everybody, for contributing. While this is something which is part of our everyday professional lives, tonight's celebration has also provided an opportunity to reflect upon this noteworthy Lancastrian space and what is actually meant by writing is freedom. Thank you very much for coming.
Well, um, we've been pretty much immersed in the 17th and 18th century for the last hour and a quarter, um, but I think we have truly experienced a 21st century public lecture, um, not only getting a series of lectures, but performances and um, entertainment all wrapped into one, and uh, certainly uh, an interactive way of learning with some audience participation as well wrapped in. Um, I'd, I'd like to um, thank my, my colleagues and all of the speakers, um, students, um, former staff, honorary graduates for their contribution tonight. Um, I think they truly conveyed their passion for the subject. In some cases, maybe enjoyed the power a little bit too much, but we'll, uh, we'll see. Um, and can I also thank you, the audience, um, for your participation and for attending um, tonight. I hope you've enjoyed the public lecture. Uh, we have a short respite from the anniversary public lecture series um, until the new year, but um, it will resume in the new year. We, we've stretched um, our anniversary year to uh, just about 15 months. Um, so uh, we, we will continue with the seri series early in the new year and there'll be some information on the way out. But uh, thank you for your engagement tonight.